our blue planet is facing one of the biggest threats in human history. Trillions of pieces of plastic are choking the very lifeblood of our Earth. And every marine animal, from the smallest plankton to the planet's largest creatures, is facing this new and growing threat. But how much do we really know about this plastic tide? Nick, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Permission to come aboard. I'm Liz Bonin, a wildlife biologist. I'm tracking down the scientists who are trying to uncover the scale of the plastic problem and what it means for life in our oceans. I'll be joining expeditions across the globe in some of the most remote and inhospitable places to discover what's happening in our oceans right now. My God, look at it. I'll work with rescue missions attempting to save some of the worst affected animals. Oh, God, the damage is unbelievable. And meet the engineers racing to design radical solutions. The world has been shaken by the plastic crisis. But can we turn the tide before it's too late? This is the story of plastic in our oceans. Last time, I travelled to Australia to discover how plastic is affecting seabirds. Oh, oh, look at that. To Indonesia to witness the problem in its rivers. I just can't believe how people can cope with this. And I met the people inventing solutions to this global crisis. What is this made of? It's made of seaweed. Now, I'm continuing my journey by investigating the impact from industries that rely on our oceans. The staggering rise in our global consumption of plastic is down to the fact that it's cheap to produce, light to transport and incredibly strong. This makes it very attractive to big industry, not least those working on the ocean who need a material that can cope with the phenomenal power of the sea. The fishing industry puts more plastic in the sea than any other sector. Fishing is one of the largest and oldest industries in the world. It employs 200 million people and nearly every net, rope and line used in commercial fishing is made of plastic. Over a million tons of plastic fishing gear is lost or dumped at sea each year. And the consequences for marine life are catastrophic. I'm heading to one of the busiest fishing grounds in the world, in New England, on the east coast of America. I'm meeting a search and rescue team to better understand how fishing gear affects sea life. They're all getting together for the, for the morning briefing, so I'm just going to run in. Um, low tide is around 2 p.m. today, um, so we're going to be trying to work around the tide. We're going to try and get out as soon as possible. Um, so yesterday we did count at least 17 animals that were entangled. Um, so the work that we're doing today is really important. Thank you all for being here. Let's get all of our gear ready and start getting people loaded up. Brian Sharp leads this team of highly trained experts and volunteers. Seeing everybody walking around with lists, lists, <laughs> yes, lists, lots. heads down, lists. It is, yes, I mean, because it, it is a massive amount of equipment, personnel, um, just the, the whole coordination of this. You know, it's something that we only get certain opportunities to do, so we want to make sure that nothing is forgotten. Our first call is to rescue a grey seal pup entangled in fishing net. It's been spotted on a sandbank two miles off the coast, and the team have to work quickly to try to save it. Look at its neck. Look at its neck. The pup is entangled in part of a gill net, 
a vertical wall of netting that traps fish by their gills. It's made of incredibly strong, thin threads of plastic that are almost impossible to break free from. This is a very young animal and with a very deep laceration. You can see it there. I can't get over um, how deep we, that is. So this is the gear that was entangling the animal. So you see it basically forms this deadly necklace around the seal. Yeah, the width of that cut, I, I, I can't. Yeah. And, it, and it, as the animal moves, as the animal swims, as the animal grows, it makes that cut deeper and wider. What do you think its chances are, Brian? It's hard to say. One, two, three, left. So the plan now is to get that young seal back to I-4 headquarters and give it 24-hour care because she's in such a bad state. Fluids, and then we'll give her some antibiotics and pain meds. All right, so we'll grab all of our stuff and we'll get out of here and give her some rest. Look at her. All right, go ahead and close those doors. It's not long before this five-month-old pup's condition deteriorates. Sadly, she doesn't make it through the night. Scratch your step there. Yeah. It's the job of biologist Misty Niemeyer to discover the cause of death for all the seals brought in by the rescue team. I join the examination of another seal who suffered a fatal neck wound. Well, we always want to... Oh, yeah, there it is. Hang on, though. Is that what the rope did? That was all done likely from this line. It somehow got this around its neck, and then it started to grow, and then it started to slowly cut into around the neck. Um, so we'll want to do... I mean, it's so young. Or how, many, how, old, how old is this? So it was probably born sometime in uh, May or June, so it's only um, a few months old. I mean, these are intelligent, social, sentient mammals. This pup was in how much pain? Um, something like this, where it's, it's around your neck, where you're trying to breathe and where you're trying to eat, um, and you're constantly moving and swimming, that it's probably um, constantly painful. So we can just try to slide this off. I think it can. will? I think so. Oh, dearie me. You guys are so amazing and pragmatic. Just <laughs> holding its little head just sent me off. Yeah, it, it can be difficult yeah. sometimes. Oh, dear. It's such a young little thing, you know? It didn't even have a chance at life at all. They're all breaking my heart. This whole situation is breaking my heart. Can you believe this is what goes on when we carry on with our lives, you know? And then they've got to go back out there and keep going and keep going, and it just never stops. It's too much. Entanglements are affecting animals all over the world killing an estimated 300,000 marine mammals a year and over 400,000 seabirds. Many of these animals have been caught in plastic fishing gear. Whales in particular are badly affected because they migrate through some of the busiest fishing grounds. One species of whale is so under threat it's being pushed to the brink of extinction. The North Atlantic right whale. To reduce the number of right whale entanglements, local authorities here have imposed strict fishing bans at the peak of their migration. And fishermen have also made significant changes to their fishing gear. But with more rules and restrictions on the horizon, a backlash is brewing. We've got so much regulation jammed up our ass. The wow. lobstermen, you're going to put them out of business. Not one of the boats in this harbor has caught a right whale, ever. Yeah. Ever. I tracked down another fisherman. Nick. Yes. I'm Liz. Hi, Liz. Very nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Permission come on to board. come aboard. Absolutely. 
Nick Muto is keen to explain the struggle the industry is facing and why plastic rope is so vital to their work. Can we see one of your lobster pot yep. systems here? So most of our end lines are 36 meters. Lobster fishing involves a lobster pot thrown to the bottom of the sea, attached to a buoy at the surface by a very long length of plastic rope. It stays in the water for several days until the fishermen return to collect it. Try to grab it from the ends and try to... Oh, God, I can't. It's heavy. How, how heavy is that? It's probably 65, almost 70 pounds. The plastic rope Nick uses can hold the weight of a family car. It's twice as strong as traditional natural fiber rope. So I actually have some of the natural fiber rope. We've got some of it right here. This is the old hemp rope. Good so, old-fashioned hemp. Okay. And as you see, when I open the valve... Whoa. How long did that take? Not long enough. Show me that with one of your plastic ropes, then. It's the same diameter, same, right? Same diameter rope. Lost. Yep. And as you can see... There's no way. There's no way. We need to make sure that we have the ability to get our gear up off the bottom of the ocean. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in wrapped up in commercial fishing. My, my wife, myself, my daughter, my three crewmen that I, and their families rely on me being able to make a living on the water. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. It's estimated that three million miles of this virtually unbreakable plastic rope is used on this coastline alone. But it's this same rope that causes terrible harm to migrating whales. Thousands of these ropes hang vertically in the water, creating a deadly obstacle course. Despite their incredible size and strength, the only way to free the whales once entangled is to attempt an incredibly dangerous rescue mission. So Liz, uh, this is our team. One of the few people skilled enough and brave enough to do this is Scott Landry. He and his team are on call seven days a week, patrolling an area over twice the size of Britain. This was on a humpback whale, and we worked on Saturday to remove this from this whale. You've literally uh, got the whole lobster pot gear. You've got the buoy at the top, the rope that extends down to the bottom of the ocean. It's just rope, a pot, and a buoy, and it can cause a really complicated problem. Scott recorded his latest mission on head cam. There's the whale. Right here, right here, right here, crossing our mouth. Yep, yep, put it in there. And there's that buoy. And the grappling hook, he doesn't want the buoy, he wants the line that's underneath the buoy. A yellow rope is hooked onto the fishing gear that's wrapped around the whale's tail, so they can edge themselves closer to one of the largest and most powerful animals on Earth. So the whale is carrying on. Oh, I can see the other rope trailing. This, 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 this is all this stuff, this is all this stuff. This is That's exactly crazy. it. And so right now, they're letting the line pay out. And the whale is dragging the boat at a fierce rate. You're going. Yes. You're being pulled the by the whale, gonna... and you've got to let that whale take you. Yeah, and the whale's going to react automatically. I, I mean, I can't get over what I'm seeing. All right. Well, we're getting the knife. It's an incredibly dangerous procedure. Last year, Scott's friend and colleague died while trying to rescue a whale. And so as the whale's at the surface, we draw ourselves closer and closer to the whale. You can see the wound and the rope going right into oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the rope notice. is plastic, it's not hemp, which is the reason why the whales are in such a pickle. Yeah. So you can see our support boat in the background. Yeah. All right, so let's see right here, grab that quick. So now on the end of that long pole is a hook-shaped knife that is extremely sharp. After hours of back-breaking work, they skillfully release the boy. 
the plastic fishing rope is cut away, finally setting the animal free. So it's now going to be free to swim away. This animal has a lot of work to do on its own now. Nothing we can do for it. We cannot give it medication, no palliative care. And so I can't say that this whale for sure is out of the woods. It's estimated that between half and two-thirds of whales in these fishing grounds have been entangled at least once in their lifetime. Whales are running from their breeding grounds to their feeding grounds, and they essentially are running a gauntlet. This is where it becomes extremely difficult for, say, a local fisherman to buy into this issue. Are you finding that the majority of entanglements are caused by active fishing gear? Yes. This, this was gear that was catching food for people. Now, getting to the point of catching whatever it is that you want on the seafloor or anywhere in the ocean without rope, that is, that's the holy grail. Okay. Yeah. Globally, there are fewer than 30 small rescue teams like this one and an estimated population of two million whales. This can never be a long-term solution. The only way to stop entanglements is to remove those vertical ropes from the water column. That's the only way they're going to really protect whales here. Some of the fishermen here are open to finding out about alternative fishing techniques. Dave Cassoni from the Massachusetts Lobstermen Association has agreed to test a new fishing system that doesn't rely on floating vertical ropes. But he has his reservations. Dave, I'm Liz. Hey, Liz. How are you doing? All right. Nice to meet you. Nice Finally. Nice to meet you. Marco, right? Yeah, right? Really good to meet you both. Marco Flagg is the engineer who's designed the new fishing gear. His invention keeps the ropes attached to the lobster pot safely out of harm's way. It's only released when the fisherman wants to haul up his trap. Don't get in my way over okay, here. Okay, okay, I'm out of your way. Very tense. Very, very tense, that's for sure. First, Dave has to set up the new system. So this line has to go inside here, and now this has to go in these gargantuan holes. <laughs> I think this is very time-consuming and difficult in sea conditions. It's tricky. The time. No, I can see now that. I'm... With everything else you've got to do. New technology, Dave. Marco has it. Yeah. He's got to attach it to that trap now. It works by storing the rope and surface buoys that would normally float in the water in a container attached to the lobster pot. You guys have got to all be away when this goes back in. All right, Dave, where do you need us to be? Up in the wheelhouse. It sort of wants to go upright. Is it going to go upright? Up, yeah. Here it goes, here it goes, here it goes. The pots can now sit on the seabed without any plastic ropes causing an obstacle to marine life. But with no visible buoys, Dave needs to use a GPS system to find his pots. You're going to the right. Oh, you can do a circle the other way. We need to turn back on ourselves, basically. I'm putting it in neutral because we're right over it. OK, we're right over it, Marco. Here we go. All right, we're, we're deploying it. it. OK. Yeah. A transmitter on the boat sends a signal down to the container, which should trigger the release of the rope and the buoys. I know I would have expected it to already be up, so there could well be a snag here somewhere. So you're asking if it would work now, no? Well, we're trying it. I gotcha. After several failed attempts, the system proved successful. There we go. Right there. Two boys. Technology is there, but there are glitches. So even though you've seen this pop up, yes. you're not confident yet? It has a lot to overcome. I'm not sure that I'm thrilled with being the pioneer on this. Why not? Because some pioneers are glorified, others are vilified. 
my saying in any way, shape, or manner that I endorse ropeless fishing will vilify me with the industry because the industry is so opposed. As a pop-up buoy, it will work. Is it practical? No. Why? Because it is too time-consuming. In our business, time is money. Dave isn't alone. Many other lobstermen are skeptical about the new technology's design and its high costs. But approximately 340 million lobsters are caught globally every year. That's millions of miles of rope across our oceans, potentially entrapping whales. An effective ropeless system could not only protect whales all around the world, but the livelihoods of fishermen too. I've heard about a different design, the brainchild of lobsterman Mike Lane. Hello, hello. I'm looking for Mike. Right here. Hi. Hi. I'm Liz. He's nice on the name. phone. Yes. Rob Morris is the engineer helping him. We wanted to come up with, first of all, a very rugged release that's basically bulletproof that Mike can't break yep. on the back of a lobster. We'll try. Or the back of his pickup truck. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we're going to wake it up for us. Power on. <clears throat> oh, okay. Something's talking to something. Yeah. This seems to be a sturdier and more feasible design. It takes just seconds to load, and the release and collection of the rope and buoys is much more straightforward. It looks pretty simple, and it looks like it would work. Why did you feel like you wanted to find a solution? You gotta be responsible for what you do in life. I don't, you know, I don't want to be responsible for killing a whale. They're beautiful creatures. I mean, we see them out there all the time. They're they're amazing, and I don't want my buoy wrapped around one. And I don't want people not to buy lobsters because they think I'm in a tangle in the whale. So I want to solve the problem. Perhaps this exciting collaboration between lobsterman and engineer can finally put an end to the threat of whale entanglements and save the northern right whale from extinction. I always feel like people portray fishermen as just a bunch of people that hate the environment and we want to rape the ocean of everything it's worth. And we're not like that. I don't have a college degree. I don't have an education. I don't have anything else I can do. My whole life has been built around lobstering, and that's what I have invested in. So what do you do when they, if your job is taken away? Well, I mean, you, you guys, you got to restart your life. How long will the bank let me go without paying my mortgage? So the sooner I get this finished and done with, the better off I'm going to be. I am really glad I got to meet Mike today, just before leaving Cape Cod. Uh, he's really struck a chord with me, and I think it's because amidst all of the contention and complex issues and the discussions, which of course need to happen, he just decided to get on with it from the start, to take it into his own hands and be a fisherman that's finding a solution to a fishing industry problem. I've spent the last nine months researching this plastic crisis, and what's becoming clear is that the very qualities that have made plastic such a central part of our lives are also those that make it so destructive to marine life. Plastic is one of the most durable materials on the planet. Virtually every single piece of plastic that's ever entered the ocean is still there. In fact, plastic has recently been found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, at a depth of seven miles. And scientists have now discovered that plastic is threatening one of the ocean's most fragile ecosystems, coral reefs. I'm heading to a part of the world known as the Coral Triangle, an area of coral reefs that stretches over 2.3 million square miles, from Indonesia to the Philippines and Papua New Guinea to the Solomon Islands. Hi. Hi. Oh, it's so nice to find you. Made it. How are you? Yes. <laughs> Can I help you with some stuff? Yes. I'm joining Assistant Professor Jolie Lam, an expert in coral ecology who is here to study why plastic is so lethal to reefs. 
corals are extraordinary animals. Our oceans contain over 9 million species of them, and the reefs they create are the largest living structures on Earth. Coral reefs are the nurseries of the sea, providing shelter for a myriad of small fish and feeding grounds for a whole host of species. But with these precious ecosystems already straining under the pressures of our modern world, plastic is posing yet another threat. There's, there's almost as much plastic as there is um, sea squirts, isn't there? Yeah, there's sachets. It's definitely not a clean body of water that we're diving in today, is it? Uh, definitely not. As soon as I'm under the surface, it's clear that this reef is in trouble. These corals are already immensely stressed due to rising water temperatures from global warming. And all around me, plastic is now covering these vulnerable animals. I help Jolie to collect samples of the plastic. She believes that another danger is threatening the coral. Just disgusting. Just disgusting. That's all I. That's all I can say. Did you think you'd see that much? No. It just never ended. But then, more than anything, it's these flipping things: coffee sachet, softener sachet. What the heck is that? I coffee? think this is a tea or coffee. A tea sachet. A soup sauce cereal. sachet. Sachet after sachet after sachet after sachet. Did you see the little so juvenile the, recruits on that bottle? Yeah. There's something really powerful about seeing a really old bottle with a coral growing out the neck of it. It's almost like nature's doing absolutely everything it can to try and survive this mess. And yet, right beside that little bit of life growing out of plastic, there is a whole area that's just dead. And this is just one of the sites, so there are many islands out here that have much more plastic than this. More than this? There can be more plastic than this. It's tragic. It's just, it's tra it's just, oh my God. We head to a nearby island to examine what might be living on the surface of the plastic we've collected. When we were coming up on the boat, it looked like a little piece of paradise, didn't it? And now, just covered. Look at all the fishing lines on the bottom of the, of the pier. Shall we offload everything on the side? Yeah, okay, we'll put this here. Jolie's new research has led her to believe that lethal doses of bacteria are being transported on the plastic. Plastics like this one here, it's just full of these little pits and pores. And even on a bottle, if you look up very closely, you can see all these nooks and crannies. So it's about the texture of plastic? Yes. The surface of plastic provides the perfect home for bacteria to thrive. One of the most dangerous bacteria for coral is found in a group called Vibrio, one strain of which causes cholera in humans. So what we're going to do is do a scraping of what's on this plastic, and we're going to test whether or not it has Vibrio. And Vibrio is a pathogen, which means it can cause disease in corals and shrimp and oysters. OK, so which sample would you like to start with? Um, let's start with the rice sack. And it, what's the liquid that's in here? So this is just uh, filtered, sterile seawater. OK. Just want to turn it into a nice green pea soup. Oh, that's brown soup, <laughs> but it's definitely soupy. And you just put four drops here and four drops here. Perfect. Jolie uses a bacteria testing kit. If a particular toxin produced by Vibrio is present, a red line will appear in the small window. 
Oh, wait, look. <gasps> that, is that Vibrio? Yes. That... Oh. Oh my God. That's that's from the sack. That's the sack. Yeah, this one is light too. So what does this mean for this reef? It's essentially a whole new way to transport diseases that we never even thought about until this year. Until this year. This year. It's not clear yet why potentially lethal doses of bacteria thrives on plastic. But the result is that plastic floating in our oceans is turning into disease-carrying rafts. Once this plastic sinks and becomes entangled in the coral, it cuts into it like an infected knife, delivering bacteria into the open wound. Coral tissue is slowly destroyed as the bacteria moves across it, in the same way that gangrene spreads across human flesh. This newly discovered threat paints a harrowing picture for the future of our reefs. So we looked at 124,000 corals with and without plastic. And when we see the plastic on the coral, the likelihood of disease goes up to 89%. 89%? Likelihood, yes. Mind-blowing. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. I thought I knew how much plastic was affecting marine life. I didn't for a second think it could also be a carrier of disease. But there is a glimmer of hope. Some reefs are showing fewer signs of disease. We swim out to one of them to investigate. Here, the coral seems to be faring better and it's even supporting an array of sea life. Jolie has been investigating possible reasons for this. As we head back to the coast, a meadow of seagrass is growing in the shallows. Jolie thinks that this seagrass could be contributing to the health of the reef. Look at it, look at what happens. Like, there's like no plastic and then it traps it. So essentially, this is the first line of defense. When you have seagrass before a coral reef, it, it physically traps the plastic. Yeah, you can see it physically slowing the water down and also trapping it like fingers. But seagrass may be doing much more than simply acting as a physical barrier. What we found recently is that the seagrass reduces harmful bacteria by 50%. 50%? 50%. That's extraordinary. Yeah. It is. Seagrass can actually kill bacteria that's harmful to people and also marine organisms. So this is really seriously important stuff. Seagrass meadows are not only trapping the plastic, they're also disinfecting it. It's thought that the grass could contain antibiotic properties that kills off the bacteria. More research needs to be done, but this is a promising discovery. It may be that nature will provide some solutions of its own to the plastic crisis. Seagrass is on every continental shelf except for Antarctica. It is one of the most important ecosystems, and so if we can start showing that it's important for small islands like this, but also where I come from and where you come from, yeah. then that's the best way we can move forward. When it comes to other global crises, when it comes to climate change, we have been studying that for decades now. We are only just beginning to really pay proper attention to plastic pollution in our oceans. And as much as there is hope with the seagrass, that can't be the only solution. It won't be. It won't be the only solution. We have to find other answers and we have to find them very, very quickly. On the closest island to the reef, villagers are trying to come up with their own solution. They're calling it the garbage bank. In 
the last 25 years to dispose of the plastic, people here are just dumping it into the ocean. Yes. I meet Professor Jamal Jompa, a marine scientist who's going to show me how the system works. The, the sea is a solution, a simple solution for them to get away from this garbage. And, and they have no other option. They haven't had any assistance from the government or anyone else about where to put it. So where else would they put it? Right. But for them, it is not a problem because they don't see that yet as a disaster. They don't see this is going to reduce or affect their livelihood. Yeah. The villagers here are taking things into their own hands. A community enterprise project has begun to make it worthwhile for locals to be more careful with their plastic. Hello, hello. So, so what is this place? This is called kind of garbage bank. The bank collects used plastic from the neighborhood, paying people by the weight they hand over. The people in the village get credit for the plastic they bring, but then what happens to this plastic? OK, so then they bring it to the city, Makassar. And then do they get money for it? Yeah, so they and get cash, basically. So in Makassar, there's a central collection. This garbage bank is the first link in a chain that's making plastic waste valuable. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> to find out if the system is effective, I follow the chain to Makassar City, the provincial capital. Good afternoon. I'm looking for Nasrun. Yes. Nasrun. Yes. Hello. Nasrun runs the facility here, sorting the plastic that arrives from 600 small garbage banks. I can in one day if the plastic is 5 tons. Because we have two kantor. Five tons a day, a day. So that makes me think two things. There is so much plastic to collect, but people are doing it. People are collecting it for you and bringing it to you. Ah, cups. I saw them preparing this on the island. Once the plastic is sorted by type. Wrapping, 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 wrapping. This is all bottles? Yeah. Various companies arrive to buy it. Nasrun, where are these bottles going now? So I've just spoken to the guy who's buying these bottles and he's allowing me to follow them to his establishment, the next link in the chain. We travel to a much bigger warehouse on the outskirts of the city. So this is it, this is your operation. The owner, Mawan Hassan has been buying and selling used plastic bottles for nine years. Mawan's team are processing thousands of bottles a day. How big is this warehouse? How many sacks of plastic bottles do you have inside that warehouse right now? Uh, stock yang sekarang di dalam ini kurang lebih 30 ton. 30 tons. You've got a full house. Full. Oof. All bottles? Yeah, special just, bottles. Just bottles. Here, the bottles are compacted before they're sold to a much bigger company in Jakarta, who shreds them up to be sold again and turned into lower-grade plastic products like carpet backing. But you know what? This? of plastic is being dealt with. 30 tons of plastic bottles are not in the oceans because of this guy. <laughs> Having grown up in Makassar and seeing the change with the plastic, do you think that your business and other businesses like yours are making a difference? I think Tidak berkurang malah bertambah plastiknya. Tidak pernah berkurang malah malah dari dari apa tren penjualan saya ke Jakarta itu tiap tahunnya malah meningkat. Berarti kan sampah malah malah justru malah, malah bertambah. So even <laughs> warehouses like this and the amount of plastic you take in is not making a difference. You don't think? Ini ini sebenarnya. Uh, Kalau mau kita urutkan ya, bahwa ini gudang saya masih terbilang kecil, masih kurang.
I'm feeling a little bit stupid right now and um, painfully naive. <laughs> like when I met Nasrun, I was so elated uh, when I thought that, oh gosh, okay, there's a solution here, there's an answer. And, and of course they're doing something. It's better than doing nothing. But what I've just learned in here is that it's not breaking the back of the plastics problem. And this isn't making a difference. Like, what does that mean about how bad, how bad this is? The reality is there simply aren't enough facilities here to keep up with this relentless deluge of plastic. But this isn't just Indonesia's problem. Across the world, only 11% of plastic is recycled. Currently, the focus is still on producing new plastic rather than recycling it. If something doesn't change, it's estimated that annual plastic production in 2050 will have increased by 500%. As scientists work tirelessly to better understand this crisis, a new plastic threat, possibly the most serious yet, is emerging. Trillions of microplastics, tiny pieces of plastic, some no bigger than a speck of dust, floating in our oceans. these microplastics are even transported to the top of the world, where I'm heading on my final expedition. We're in Longyearbyen, the northernmost town in the world on the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard. 1,300 kilometers that way is the North Pole. We're heading deeper inside the Arctic Circle. It's as untouched and remote a place as I think I've ever been, and yet we're here to investigate a plastic threat that's reached even here. It's the middle of summer, so you get 24 hours of daylight here, which is why at 2.30 in the morning, it looks like this, and it might be a little bit hard to get to sleep on the journey up. I'm joining Dr. Amy Lusher, a leading expert on microplastics, on a three-day journey to one of the most extraordinary places on Earth. The Arctic is home to some of our most astounding wildlife. Magnificent polar bears roam the ice. Walruses haul out on the beaches and majestic narwhals and belugas hunt in the freezing waters. We sail for nine hours to a remote Arctic beach. Miles from any human habitation. Where exactly are we? We're on a spit of land. It's called uh, Prince Carl's Fjordland. And over there is the North Atlantic leading into the Norwegian Sea. And up there is the Arctic. We are in a very remote part of the planet. And yet the plastic reaches even here. Tomato ketchup, good yeah, lord. That's a tomato ketchup. With <laughs> I mean, I can't believe the nozzle and the bottle separated at whatever stage. It's obscene. Up here in the Arctic, the plastic becomes really, really brittle quite quickly, and they just start to break down. So, yeah, it just snaps in your hand. The plastics dumped on this beach have been transported by ocean currents that act like huge conveyor belts. Much of this plastic has traveled here from Northern Europe. Finding big pieces of plastic in one of the most remote places on Earth is alarming enough. Do you take this and fill it up with some nice clean water? But Amy is much more concerned with the smaller fragments. We take a closer look at the sand. So now we're just going to take a scoop of the top layer of sand. Okay. And put the sand in 
carefully. And if we tape it so it comes out of this corner, it will be a lot easier for us. There's loads of bits of plastic floating <laughs> on the top. <laughs> we call them microplastics. Normally, it's anything less than one millimetre in size is a microplastic. Microplastic. Much of it is a result of larger pieces breaking up at sea, but it's also coming from some more surprising sources. Microscopic fibres are being washed out of our synthetic clothing. In August 2018, a team at Plymouth University in the UK revealed that in each synthetic wash cycle, more than 700,000 microplastic fibres are released into the environment. Microbeads in toothpaste and face scrubs are being washed down the sink. And rain is flushing tiny plastic fragments from our car tyres into drains. It just keeps getting more and more complex. I've been focusing on the big bits of plastic and, and, and how they're affecting wildlife. This is a, almost overwhelming to think about all of this stuff. It's a little bit scary when you think about it. Um, originally, they used to say the only places that we hadn't found microplastics were the Arctic and Antarctic, but it's, um, <laughs> it's in front of us here. Scientists now believe that the Arctic has some of the highest levels of microplastics in the world. And it's found its way into the food chain. In a recent study at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, scientists injected a fluorescent marker into microplastics. They discovered that tiny plankton are ingesting them. They then focused their research up the food chain to small fish, mussels, clams and oysters and discovered that they were ingesting microplastics too. The concern now is that microplastics are heading further up the food chain to some of the biggest ocean predators. This island is home to a colony of walruses. This one's rolling into the water. And Amy wants to find out if microplastics have made their way into their diet. What a sight for sore eyes. This is the first time anyone has investigated this. I'm just watching these stunning juveniles just frolicking. <laughs> it's the only word I can think of. I mean, look at them. They're joyful here. Despite weighing over a ton, walruses mostly feed on small mussels and clams living on the ocean floor. They dive and forage along the seabed, rooting through the sediment with their snouts. They can eat up to 6,000 mussels and clams in a day. They've noticed us. They don't seem tense or nervous about our presence. And it's just such a beautiful sight. To discover if walruses are ingesting microplastics, Amy needs to analyse their faeces. Poo! I just found poo! Oh, I, I can smell it from here. This is a huge one. That, that must be the dominant male. It's got to be. <laughs> This has even got a little fibre in it. A microfibre? Yeah. Already, there are signs of microplastics. Fibre in this one, too. Yeah, fibre. Yeah. Back in the lab, it doesn't take long to confirm what Amy has suspected. So I found a fibre. I can see it. I can see it. So if you look down here, you'll okay. see it a lot clearer. OK. So that is a fragment of plastic. And from the shape so of it, you can see oh, that it's... it's red. Yeah, it's bright reds. And you can see that it's a piece of plastic that's been shaved. So, the first evidence of plastic mm. inside the faeces of walruses in the Arctic. Yeah. Is this plastic that's coming the whole way up the food chain, from the plankton to the mussel to the walrus? We know that the mussels have the plastic in. The whole nature and the way that the walrus feeds 
it's very likely that it's come from its prey. So that's it. In the Arctic, one of the most remote, seemingly pristine places in the world, there is plastic from the very bottom of the food chain all the way up to the top. What does that mean for such a precious, fragile ecosystem like the Arctic that's already under tremendous pressure from mankind and the way we live? As more plastic enters the environment, there's going to be more plastic available for animals to ingest. And we're going to see more plastic than anything else inside the animals. And I think that's quite shocking. With evidence of microplastics throughout the entire food chain, it raises the question, what effect is it having on us? Scientists have now discovered that plastic is entering our bodies from a whole host of different sources. From the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. The research about how all this plastic may be affecting us is in its infancy. But the evidence we have about how it affects marine life paints a disturbing picture. As the ocean plastic crisis becomes ever more apparent, more and more people are taking action to become part of the solution. All across the globe, people are giving up single-use plastic items like straws, takeaway cups and plastic bags, and they're heading to the water's edge. The cleanup efforts taking place all around the world are incredible, but the thought I just can't get out of my head is, we can try to clean up our rivers and coastlines. We can even try to clean up the plastic that's far out at sea. But unless we turn off the plastic tap, the unrelenting deluge that enters our oceans every day simply will never stop. If we don't, the result will be catastrophic for all marine life. From the smallest creature to the largest mammal, our planet depends on a healthy and thriving ocean for its very survival. We can do this. We can save our oceans. But we need to act before it's too late. <laughs>